Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour back in our Father's Word. The book of Amos, Amos meaning burden, the burden that our Father has for His people. Uh, you might call it compassion, but at the same time, it's correction. Why? Because God loves them. And if God loves you, He's going to chastise you when you step out of line. You can always count on it. We're in this sixth chapter, and what he's saying here, let's amplify it all the way to the end times, prophetically speaking. It has to do with the severity of the deception. I mean, it's, if, if you've got um, ten men in one house, they're, they're going to all be deceived. Or as it is written in verse 9, they die. Okay? And it is a spiritual death to worship the false Messiah just before the true Christ returns. That's a sad, sad situation. And then they spoke of the fact that um, a man's uncle, which is kind of a more distant relative, uh, a kinsman redeemer, that would cremate the bodies. Um, and if one should be left to say, don't mention God's name, it's so far gone, there's no hope for you. Well, there's always hope. I don't care who you are, um, there, there's always hope and God will hear you. So let's pick it up after that was said in verse 11 of chapter 6, the great book of uh, Amos, a uh, word of wisdom from our Father, and it reads, For uh, behold, the Lord commandeth, and he will smite the great house with breaches. That, that's to say, he, he with the... Um, uh, it's an interesting Hebrew word. It means the drippings, okay? In other words, it's, it's going to turn to water, okay? And the little house with clefts, meaning he's going to slice it with a breach right down the side. Verse 12. And, and here, we kind of, this is kind of said in irony, okay? It, it's saying, if you think this is silly, what you're doing is a lot sillier, okay? That's the thought. Let's cover it. Verse 12, shall horses run upon the rock? Now, this is a slick rock. And Now, if you're a horseman, you never run a horse on slick rocks or you're, you're going off and it's going down. You're going to ruin an animal if you're not careful, okay? So you do not run a horse on slick rocks. Will one plow there with oxen, and you're going to have to, the word there you will notice is in italics, and you have to add C, okay? Does, uh, so let's ask it in that way. Will one plow in the sea with oxen? Of course not, that's ridiculous. For ye have turned judgment into gall. It's not as silly as what you're doing. You turn that that should be justified into bitterness, and the fruit of righteousness into hemlock. You take the fruit that should be uh, gained from that that is right, and you put poison on it. That, that uh, hemlock is, is, if you would, it's drugs, okay? All, all drugged out. It's the same word that was wormwood in an earlier chapter, okay, in the Hebrew manuscripts. So our, our father, a lot of people wonder, well, does he have a sense of humor? Well, this wasn't said in humor. It was said in, as a challenge, you know, that um, you wouldn't ride a horse on slick rocks and you wouldn't plow with oxen in the sea. I mean, that's that, that'd be really silly to even try it. But it's not as silly as what you're doing, being deceived, listening to the traditions of men, molding calves to worship in the house, uh, my house, Bethel, if you would, God's church, in Samaria, talking to the ten tribes. You just, uh, it's, you're, you're quite silly, is what he's saying. And, um, and it's really a, kind of an insult to 
of awareness to wake them up. Okay, verse 13. Ye which rejoice in a thing for, of naught, which say, have we not taken to us horns by our own strength? You know, creating your own salvation is a bad thing. Okay, that's, that's what the people were doing that built the Tower of Babel. Okay, trying to build their own way to heaven. God doesn't approve of that. It's quite, a, quite honestly, He is very much against it. Why, they're leaving God out of the equation. What has been the topic of the chapter uh, prior in this one? Seek ye the Lord and prepare to meet your Lord. And you want, seek means to do a little bit of work on your part to search Him out. What is it that God would have us do instead of trying to plan together with man's traditions of what works for man? It's really important that you plan for life eternal rather than just a short age right here in the flesh bodies. You've got a much better body than a flesh body that is eternal. And it's much better to build to the kingdom of God, to, that is to say, to be able to enjoy it, than it is to enjoy yourself here in pleasures that um, are silly. Verse 14, but behold, but, but you look here, I will raise up against you a nation, O house of Israel. This is that nation he spoke of in Joel chapter 1, verse 6, saith the Lord, the God of hosts, and they shall afflict you from the entering in of Hamath, of Hamath, we'll say, unto the river of the wilderness. This will, there's quite a threat there, and you never want to forget that verse. He said, Behold, I, am, I will raise up against you a nation, O house of Israel, saith the Lord God of hosts, and they shall afflict you from the entering in of Hamath, unto the river of the wilderness. Wilderness is ha arivia, which means the end of the day. Neither day, night or day. Okay, it's all over, it's the end. In other words, he's going to be with you all the way to the end. But you've got to know who Hemoth is. And you've heard me, you've heard me refer to it more than one time. First Chronicles chapter 2, verse 55. You've got to know who Hemoth is. And when, when you let the Kenites in, he said, you're going to have them with you right up to the end of time. And you better be watchmen and be prepared for it. That was his prophecy. And if there ever a prophecy has come to pass, it, come, it, has, it is true today. Um, that 55th verse of the second chapter of 1 Corinthians, 1 Chronicles, rather, uh, correction, First Chronicles reads, And the families of the scribes, th these are attached on to Judah. They're not of the house of Judah. They're simply scribes that are with him. They're, they're hired out to keep the book records, to change them if they choose. You want to be real careful who you get to do your book work. Okay? You better know who you can trust. The families of the scribes which dwelt at Jabez, the Terathites, the Shimeathites, the Shushathites, these are the Kenites, K-E-N-I-T-E-S, that is the sons of Cain. That's what the word means in the Hebrew tongue. The sons of Cain that came of Hemoth. Well, who was Hemoth? The father of the house of Rechab doesn't get any worse than that, my friend. And our Father gives you a warning there if you're able to receive it. From the entering in of Hemoth until the very close of the day, you're going to have trouble with them. Trouble with who? The sons of Cain, the Kenites. Jesus warned of them over and over. He would, he would even... Uh, speak of them in Matthew chapter 23, over and over. So there you have it. And um, uh, our, our Father is always honest with us. And you remember back in the book of Joel when he said, when, they, when that locust army of Satan's, his little children come after you, you're going to wonder what happened. Has this ever been happened before? 
No, not, in, not since the beginning of time. It's coming. The deception is going to be upon us. If there's 10 men in one room, they'll all die a spiritual death because they're going to be taken in by it if they haven't studied God's Word. Well, why would God warn us of this? So you're not deceived. So that you have eternal life. Chapter 7, verse 1. Listen carefully. Thus hath the Lord God showed unto me, and behold, he formed grasshoppers, that's locusts, in the beginning of the shooting up of the latter growth, and lo, it was the latter growth after the king's mowings. Now, what is said here? What are the king's mowings? Taxation. Okay. The old king gets his part, and, and when he, he gets his part, he turns the locust loose on the rest of it, and guess what you end up with? Nothing. This has to do with usury in the end times if you allow yourself to be entrapped within it. And, and um, many, many of you work very hard paying off a home, and a young person, that's the way you got to do it, okay? But you figure out what you've done, and I'll just pick some round numbers in comparison. It, let's say that if you pay $10,000 a year in payments on your property, do you know how much of it actually goes in your pocket to... to to your house, about $1,000, and $9,000 goes into the pockets of the users, the usury, okay, interest. Didn't, I mean, it didn't get you anything other than the use of some printed paper. We've, that's the king's mowings in more ways than one, okay. And another way, inflation can do this to you. And also, like credit card companies, many of you will receive letters to, within the next few days, if you haven't already, that they're going to add another 8% interest plus what is common usury to people that use certain credit cards. Why? Well, they've lost a lot of money, and they're going to make it up, and guess who's going to pay for it? And I warned you a couple of months ago, don't get involved. You better be set. Better be ready for it, because it's not a healthy thing. Now, the king's mowing's all right, and then after it's mowed, the locusts are turned loose, and they eat what's left. What does that leave for you? Not a, not a thing. Okay. Verse 2, And it came to pass that when they had made an end of eating the grass of the land, that's to say the locusts, then I said, O Lord God, forgive, I beseech thee, by whom shall Jacob arise? For he is small. How, how is he going to get over this? How can he, out, how can he outdo Hemoth when we allow Hemoth to get his hands in your pocket? Verse 3, the Lord, the Lord repented for this. It shall not be, saith the Lord. I'm not going to let him take everything. They still get a big part, my friend. Verse 4, Thus saith the Lord God, thus hath the Lord God showed unto me. And behold, the Lord God called to contend by fire, and it devoured the great deep and did eat up a part. Verse 5, Then said I, O Lord God, cease, I beseech thee. By whom shall Jacob arise? This is all the tribes of Israel now. For he is small. And, and of course, what this is, don't, don't kid yourself, it's the fire of deception in these end days. And, and if, if God had not intervened, the deception would have taken everyone. But God repented and his elect still teach the truth whereby the deception isn't 100%. Verse 6, the Lord repented for this. This also shall not be, saith the Lord God. Um, I, I, won't, I won't do this to the completeness. Meaning the elect are still sealed in their forehead and they're going to teach that truth. And Jacob shall rise through Jesus Christ. Verse 7, thus he showed me 
And behold, the Lord stood upon a wall made by a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. Now, what does that mean? That a plumb line is a a plummet, that is to say, a, a heavy stone or metal on the end of a string. And when you hold the top of the string, the plummet, by the law of gravity, God's own law of gravity, holds that in a straight line, so therefore it was a straight wall built accurately, and God is holding that plumb line for us to go by, okay, so that it's not crooked, it's always straight, and it's plumb square and level, and um, as a builder, um, that's decent. God is showing us the way. And don't ever kid yourself, Christ is the plumb line that we go by. Okay. Verse 8, And the Lord said unto me, Amos, what seest thou? Question. And I said, A plumb line. Then said the Lord unto me, Behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not again pass by them anymore. And of course, um, as I stated, that plumb line that is set in Israel is the Lord Jesus Christ. That is to say, Emmanuel, God with us. And how precious it is. Verse 9, And the high places of Isaac, that's Israel, shall be desolate. And the sanctuaries of Israel, that's the churches, shall be laid waste. And I will raise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Now, here we go back in history for a proof. We're all the way back to Samaria now, where the ten tribes are there with King Jeroboam, of whom's people are many, is what it means. And um, God has already said, I I'm going to send somebody, and they're going to take them captive. They are. Do you know, first of all, uh, why would God lay uh, the sanctuaries of Israel there of Jeroboam waste? W what's in them? Two golden calves. And you're supposed to worship the golden calves instead of the Lord God Almighty. That's, that's why God is upset with this people. And, and hey, marvel not. If you have sanctuaries or churches today that play church instead of teaching God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, whereby the people are warned of that that is coming, warned from the Word of God, then he looks upon it as about the same thing. So this is why he's saying those houses that claim to be sanctuaries, claim to be churches, I'm taking them out. Verse 10, Then Amaziah, uh-oh, Amaziah means um, uh, the strength of the Lord, okay, of Yahweh, okay. I mean, what a, what a name. The priest of Bethel, I mean, he's the priest of that house, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos hath conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. You know, well, you've got this Amos. He came, he's not even of us. He came up here from Judah. And here he come up to the ten tribes. He's a stranger here. And he's, he's coming forth. He's conspiring against you, the king. And you've got to remember who... Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, well, the priest of God's house. Yeah, but what's in the house? Again, I don't want to have to remind you, the two the golden calves. He's an idolatrous priest. Okay. He's no good. Even though he's got a nice name, the strength of the Lord. And even though he calls himself preacher. And even though he's over the whole house of uh, of worship there of Jeroboam, the king of Israel. He's a dud. Okay. I mean, he's not going to be able to deliver you eternal life because he's a fake. He never gets around to teaching God's word and even teaches against God's word by saying, you don't have to go to Jerusalem. Worship the golden calves here. 
And then when God does send a prophet up there to warn them, this is what he gets. Amaziah keeps going, verse 11. For thus Amos said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive out of their own land. You know what? That's just a lie. That is just not true. Now, now well, would, would God's word lie? God didn't say it. This crooked priest said it. Amos didn't. He's lying. Amos did not say that Jeroboam would die by the sword. That is a bald-faced lie. But that's where a fake preacher will get you, my friend. You want to be real careful. You better know um, when God has sent someone and when you've got a, an idol priest worshiper, okay? It's just not true. Verse 12, also Amaziah said unto Amos, O thou seer. Seer is a word for prophet, okay? You can see the future. O thou seer, go, flee thee away from into the land of Judah, and there eat bread. Make your living down there. Get out of my house and prophesy there. He just, uh, you know, uh, again, God sent this man up there. And this false priest is trying to tell him to get out. Go make your living down south somewhere, down there with the tribe of Judah where you came from, and leave us alone. Verse 13, But prophesy not again anymore at Bethel. You stay out of the house of God. Is that the kind of church you want to attend? Not much of a chance today either if you're not careful. For it is the king's chapel and it is the king's court. Well, it's supposed to be God's. Okay. It really is. The king of kings and lord of lords. But certainly they've driven him away. Just as people try to drive God out of the vocabulary today. And worship nonsense. Runs amuck in the whole nation. You want to be careful, my friend. The majority of Americans and Christians around the world still to this day believe in Almighty God and hold up for Almighty God and serve Almighty God. And, but you do have a few that try to hurt everyone else. Don't let it. Okay. Verse 14. Here we get an answer from Amos finally. Then answered Amos, and he said to Amaziah, I was no prophet Neither was I a prophet's son, but I was an herdman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. Sycamore fruit is, in the Hebrew is a wild fig. And, um, and certainly he, this is what he did. It, but you want to be careful here. He was a herdsman of a, a stunted sheep, a very small sheep. That, but they, what they did, they produced the very fanciest of wool, the very best. And that reminds you of God's elect, okay? They're kind of small in number compared to the numbers of the world. But it's the finest truth you'll ever find anywhere because it's God's truth that they bring forth. And the wild fig is the fig that is the good basket that you can ride with that will never perish, but will be there for you, okay? And uh, that's, that's what uh, Amos, I mean, he, he, wasn't a, he was no preacher. And he wasn't even a preacher's son. <clears throat> but God picks whomever he wants to. And when God sends someone, they are sent. Verse 15. And the Lord took me as I followed the flock. And the Lord said unto me, Go prophesy unto my people Israel. Not Judah, but my people Israel. That's where God sent him. 16. Now therefore hear thou the word of the Lord. Thou sayest prophesy not against Israel. And drop not thy word against the house of Isaac. 
that also Israel. 17, Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Thy wife shall be an harlot in the city, and thy sons and thy daughters shall fall by the sword, and thy land shall be divided by line, and thou shalt die in a polluted land, and Israel shall surely go into captivity forth of his land. In other words, Israel in the end times is going to be deceived utterly. But what happened to this group and the type that set forth, whereby you know today, they were taken captive by the Assyrian, and they did. They, they, were, they went into a heathen land where they were nothing but prisoners. <clears throat> and yet at the same time, God delivered them in as much as they went north, ultimately, over the Caucasus Mountains, settling Europe, and later America, Canada, basically your Christian nations of today. That's where the house of Israel, not the house of Judah, but that's where the house of Israel, these ten tribes, dwell today. <clears throat> Unfortunately, most of them know not from whence they came. Most of them do not know who they are. And you would think that they would wonder, with this great nation being a superpower of superpowers, and that we have the freedom and the right to a freedom of speech, freedom of worship, the right to bear arms to protect our children and our family, then that's no accident. God loves His children when they follow Him. It is a comforting thing to know that on a, on a poll that was taken within the last week of this broadcast, 80% of Americans believe in Almighty God, one way or the other, okay? One denomination or the other. 80% weighing in on the side of Almighty God. That's a comforting thought, and it makes you wonder how strong a voice that so few that are against God gain for themselves in a nation with that freedom of speech. <clears throat> All it means is, excuse me, that those, we're free to stand up and make ourselves heard and to put down the voices of opposition. We don't give up ground, we take ground. Okay. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 8, verse 1. Thus hath the Lord God showed unto me, and, and um, behold, a basket of summer fruit. Th this means it is, summer fruit is it's ripe fruit. I mean, the honey is dripping from it, and it is so ripe that it's about ready to just fall off and rot. Okay, it's so ripe that it would spoil quickly. Okay, it, which means what? It, Israel's ready for harvest. It lets you know, I mean, it's just down to a short time that it's got to be harvested or it'll spoil. So it is with Israel. Verse 2, And he said, Amos, what seest thou? Question. And I said, A basket of summer fruit. That's ripe fruit. And then said the Lord unto me, The end is come upon my people of Israel. I will not again pass by them anymore. They're ripe for chastisement ripe for punishment. Three, and the songs of the temple shall be howlings in that day, saith the Lord God. There shall be many dead bodies in every place. They shall cast them forth with silence. Um, that's, um, what does it mean? Spiritually dead. You know, it is, is really a shame that in a nation where we have the freedom to worship, that Many people, many, will worship the first Messiah that shows on earth that is supernatural because they have not been taught. They have not been taught the simplicity that is in the Word of God, that the false Christ comes at the sixth trump, the true Christ comes at the seventh, and there's at least a minimum of a five-month spread between the two. 
and people are going to have to put up with the false Christ for five months. That's too late to get yourself educated as to who the true Christ is after the fake shows up. Because in ignorance, most, according to God's word, will worship him. Why? They haven't been taught. They've been taught this doctrine. He's showing up and you're going to fly away before the tribulation and you have nothing to worry about. They've even been told by would-be preachers of God's Word, you don't have to understand God's Word. You don't have to understand the book of Revelation. Why? You're going to be gone. That's, a, that's not a truth, my friend. That's false teaching. Because God's elect are going to be here with the gospel armor on and in place to stand against the fiery darts of Satan as the false Christ. As, as Matthew uh, 24 and Mark 13 declare exactly even down to a lot of the words that will be said from the book of Joel that we covered recently. What a fantastic time. Um, our Father's in charge. And, and, you know, you can see when you know the truth how ripe our people are for correction. Let's go one more verse, please. Verse 4, Hear this, O ye that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to fail. Take advantage of the people. Verse 5, saying what? Saying, when will the new moon be gone that we may sell corn? Question. Rip them off. And the Sabbath that we may set forth wheat, making the ephah small. In other words, making a little bitty bushel and the shekel great, charging a huge price for it and falsifying the balances by deceit. We'll even falsify the scales and sell them short in weight. Bunch of crooks. Okay. So uh, God doesn't like crooks. And God makes quick work out of crooks. Because of um, the banking institutions, you want to wake up as to what's happening. Those old balances and scales have been so shortened, and the American people are having to pay bills that they don't deserve to have to pay. And uh, that time has come to pass right before our very eyes. And you want to wake up, find out tomorrow in the next lecture what it is they're selling. All right, bless your heart, you listen a moment, won't you please? Ezra and Nehemiah. These two books are necessary to understand the returning to the Father in that sense of the example set forth in the end times of the rebuilding of God's most favorite place on earth. Also, within these two books, you find the hidden secret, hidden from most people's eyes, that the study in the Hebrew and the Chaldee that is given in these particular books will teach you how that the priesthood itself became polluted during this period of time. This is to say about 400 years before Christ walked the earth to the time that he did walk, instructing you very wisely, setting the example of how it is that we gather back to Christ himself. Ezra and Nehemiah, fantastic. You'll enjoy them. And there we are. Back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the Spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular uh, reverend or denomination. Uh, let's don't judge people. You will never hear me mention the name of a church. Why? Well, they're trying, and unfortunately, many of them are misled. And, well, how can I tell the difference? Well, whether they teach God's Word or man's Word. It's real simple, okay? Real easy to tell the difference. But the main thing is, let your question be concerning God's truth, whereby we grow and God magnifies our efforts as we stay in His Word, doing it His way, in His earth, and His heaven. 
Uh, all right, those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. And your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address, okay? You got a prayer request, you don't need the number, you don't need an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking. Do you understand that He's your Father and that He loves you? So many people try to put God with the pitchfork and the horns that He's ready to destroy people. No, He loves His children. He will correct them just as you would correct your children because He doesn't want you to get hurt. He wants you to be with Him forever. I don't know, how do you feel about it? Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and questions. How long has Pastor Arnold Murray been a pastor? Lynn from North Carolina. Oh, 55 years plus, something like that. A long, long time. Um, it, it might be really nice to retire someday. But I don't, you know, I've, I've thought about retiring and I thought, well, I can't retire until God says it's okay. And so far, He hasn't said it's okay. Maybe, maybe retirement comes in heaven. Who knows? But be that as it may, we thank our Father for good health and the, the blessing of being allowed to teach His Word. Thank you for the question. Sheila from Louisiana. What are the works of God? Where can I read it in the Bible? Very first verse. Okay. You can read it all through, but what does it say His works were? In the very first verse, in the beginning, in the beginning God created, worked the heaven, and by creating the heavens and the earth, period. Didn't say when, it was millions of years ago. And Satan rebelled, and then he destroyed that earth age and brought this one into being. But the whole word is about God's works. He works among His children because He loves them. He corrects them. He, gives, he warns them. You know, that's what teaching is about in part, is to warn how to stay out of trouble, how to stay out, off of those old wilderness passes, uh, paths that if you go down, you're going to get in trouble. Our Father, you know, He, he even sent us the book of Ecclesiastes, which is uh, in the Old Testament. It's a book written to the man that walks under the sun, meaning in a flesh body, telling us while you're in these flesh bodies how to get along, how to be successful, how to be happy, how to be healthy. He's real good to us. That's the works of God, the whole works. Uh, Neil from Oklahoma. I've always heard that God is a spirit, and you said He came down in a vehicle. Well, I, I didn't say He came down in a vehicle. Ezekiel did, okay? It's written very, very um, clearly. If He is a spirit, why does He need a vehicle and is what people call UFOs, the vehicles angels and God uses? Well, they're not unidentified to Him, and there's good and there's bad. It's according to who's driving it, okay, or controlling it. Now, um, uh, let me tell you something, Neil, you have a spirit. I mean, th there is Neil's spirit, okay. But you still have a body also, don't you? Right? You're not just floating around like the wind, are you? Or making wind, okay. It, um, I think you have a body. Well, so does our Father. He has a spirit. It's called the Holy Spirit, okay. And... Uh, he certainly, uh, when he said, what did he say about in Genesis 1.27 about making man? Let us make man in our image, including himself. And when you saw Christ, as you would read in John chapter 14, Christ would say, if you see me, you've seen the Father. Why? Because they look just alike. Why? Because made in his perfect image. He has a body. But he also has a spirit. I have a spirit. Everybody has a spirit. Uh, and you can utilize that spirit in teaching or in whatever you choose to do. It can't even be evil if you, if you turn evil. Then it becomes an evil spirit. So everybody has a spirit. Everybody has a soul. Everybody has a body. Okay, Magdalene from Oregon. 
Um, a question, where can I find spare the rod and spoil the child? And my second question is, I just found in Leviticus 19.28, don't ever tattoo your skin. I don't know, I didn't know this before. I had a small tattoo on the yellow, of a yellow rose put on my shoulder and I asked God to forgive me. Should I get it removed? Well, of course not. You were 18 when you had it done. Is it pretty? Okay, you know, it's there now. And it's not a sin unto death to have a tattoo, all right? So, um, any sin committed in ignorance is no sin, period. Forget it, okay? Uh, if you repented of it, God's already forgot about it, it's over. And you know something? You, you might say, well, I, I hate to take that tattoo to heaven with me. You don't have to worry, you're not. Your flesh body, which the tattoo is carrying, is going to remain here. And you have a beautiful spiritual body that is pretty, prettier than a yellow rose, all told. Okay, so you got a lot going for you. You hang in there. Uh, to spare the rod and spoil the child, I, I like to use Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24. Okay, Proverbs 13, verse 24. But I also like to use the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5. You know, because if God loves you, He's always going to chastise you. A lot of people have trouble knowing that, but if, if, as long as God corrects you, it means He still loves you. Okay. He's our Father, and He also does not spare the rod. Mary from North Carolina. Pastor Murray, will you explain John 3, 5? Also, if you die and you are saved, will you go to heaven if you without, haven't been baptized? Okay, you're thinking about John 3, 5, where you must, one must be born of the waters and the flood. Do you know what that means? When, when one is birthed, they, they are in a bag of waters. Now, what God is talking about here is the Nephilim, that's to say the fallen angels, they weren't born again, which should be translated born from above. They fell from above without being born of the bag of waters. They rather seduced woman, and the offspring thereof were gebers, giants. So um, that's what it means, what God is saying Every soul must be born of woman in a bag of waters. You can't leave your place of habitation like the fallen angels did to mess up God's overall plan of salvation. He won't tolerate it. So, uh, so then if you are thinking that means you must be born by baptizing, you could have baptized the fallen angels. It wouldn't have made any difference. They weren't born of the bag of waters, born of the waters, okay? They fell. That's, that's what God is talking about. And that's why in the same chapter, in a verse just past that verse, where it says you must be born again, only it's mistranslated. It should say you must be born from above, meaning you come from above, entering the mother's womb, the bag of waters, and then you're birthed, okay? That's natural, and that's the way God wants it. Now, as far as um, uh, the thief that was crucified with Christ was not baptized, and yet he repented, and Christ said, This day I will see you in paradise. So he went to the right side of paradise without being baptized. Now, should a person be baptized? Yes. Well, why? Well, because Christ set the path for us, and Christ was baptized. Okay, it, it is to say publicly that you believe Christ died, went in, into the tomb, and came out. You went into the waters and came out. And you're saying that publicly, and it's between you and the Lord. Okay, So really, you should be. But many people that have not had an opportunity to, if they are serving God, that will not prevent them from entering heaven. Liz from Tennessee, can you please tell me where the Ark of the Covenant is? I'm thinking it is in heaven. Thank you, Pastor Murray, for, um, oh, you're so very welcome. 
Um, yes, and you will find by reading Revelation chapter 11, reading the last two verses of that chapter, the covenant, the Ark of the Covenant is, is in heaven, okay? And um, how did it get there? Well, there's been some people taken there that it could have gone along, uh, Elijah and others. Helen from Texas. <clears throat> I have a problem with the parable of Matthew 25 in the talents. I, I've read it over and over, and I'm still, I don't understand what it is about. It's, it's a parable. Some, it is probably something that a child can understand, and I, I feel dumb asking. No, you don't have to feel dumb asking. There, if you don't understand a thing, well, then you should ask. And no, no problem. The talents have to do with investing the truths of God's Word. Okay. In other words, God gives each of us truths. And He expects us to trade with them, to trade them off by giving them to someone else. Okay. Now, uh, to some He gives ten. Well, they can cut it. They can handle it. And, and that, but... Some he gives five. Does that mean they're not as important as the one with ten? Not at all. God knows our capabilities. Okay. Finally, this person, he only gives one. And what does the one with one do? Instead of trading with it, in other words, by sharing the truth that God gave him, he took it and he hid it. He kept it in his own mind. He would not tell anyone. And God, that, that upsets our Father. Don't hide your light under a bushel. Okay? Same meaning. Okay? God doesn't give you a light to shine and you cover it up where nobody can see it. Okay? And of course that truth is the Word of God. And, and uh, that's what God expects you to do. When He gives you something, share it. Share it with others. <clears throat> Otherwise, He'll never give you anything else. Um, and there, I, I should hasten to add, there are certain things that are private that God gives one for privacy. That you will know if he ever does that. And uh, it is not necessarily something you're to share, but to do when he, when he reacts in that way. Okay? No problem. He means when God gives you a truth, share it with some, a family member or someone else. Uh, Don from Arkansas. Um, I anyway, I thought I heard you say Jesus Christ was conceived on December the 25th. Please help me with this. Well, that's correct. Christ was conceived on December the 25th. You see, in, in the great book of Luke, in chapter 1, when Elizabeth, who was a cousin to Mary, when her husband... Um, Zacharias was serving the course of Abiah. That's a date. Okay. The course of Abiah is a course that is a date. And um, when, as soon as, uh, and the angel came to him, Gabriel, and said, your wife is going to conceive. She was too old, but she's going to do it anyway. And then it takes him about a two-day journey, and he goes home and Elizabeth conceives, and when she was five months pregnant, the angel came to Mary, and she conceived, running instantly to Elizabeth. And when she approached Elizabeth with the babe in her womb, five months leapt when the approach of the Holy Spirit came. That's to say, Christ's Spirit. So Christ began dwelling with us in December the 25th, the day of conception. That's when it happened. Uh, his birth was approximately September the 29th uh, at the Feast of Tabernacles, last day. Um, okay, uh, Kelly from Colorado. Usually I have lots of questions for you. I always seek answers from His Word using the Strong's Concordance and Prayer uh, for understanding Christ. I know I'm okay. I'm just have the incredible instability desire, inst insational de desire to mourn my son being gone. And I see that you have lost your 
your son. I have to wonder, isn't that pretty normal? I know you suggested reading 1 Corinthians 10, 13. That too, but also know that um, who does Christ bring with him? He's putting together an army up there, okay? And um, uh, knowing your son, I think uh, he'll be with him, okay? <clears throat> Good trooper. There are many things that we do not understand, but you do have to know he's with the Father already, okay? And um, the Father loves him, and um, actually that's what all of we Christians work forward to in God's time and in God's way, okay? God bless you. We'll you be in her prayers, okay? Rodney from Florida. I, incidentally, I must say, you're doing real good. You just, just hang tough. Rodney from Florida. Pastor Murray, when you pray, you say in the name of Yeshua. What does Yeshua mean? Well, that's, that's Yeshua is Yahweh's Savior, which is what Jesus means in Hebrew. In other words, it is the word Jesus in the Hebrew tongue. I use it both ways for a simple reason. I'm a teacher. And God's sacred name, Yahweh, everyone should know. We can call him God, but do you understand that in the manuscripts, God is just E-L-L. -L. It's not really his name. It's an office. When Moses went to the mountain, Moses said, what am I, who am I going to say sent me? And he said, I am that I am which is the etymology, etymology of the tetragrammation of Yahweh. And um, the, the very sacred name itself is locked in in an acrostic in the book of Esther where man can't mispronounce it. And uh, it's a beautiful thing. So as a teacher, I use the sacred names to teach people the sacred name, the name that God said to call him. And, um, and so it is, okay? Uh, Sydney from Arkansas. The, when someone passes away and goes to heaven, do they still remember you and their other loved ones on earth? Of course they do. Ezekiel 44, verse 20 through 25, uh, has to do with the Millennium Temple. And... Um, they knew you can go help a mother, father, brother, sister, meaning you got to recognize them in the spiritual body. Okay, Same image, same likeness. Jay from Kentucky. Do you have to go to church to be right with the Lord? Well, it's, you know, a lot of times you don't have a church that really teaches God's Word near you. So naturally, if you study God's Word, you're right with Him. Um... There are many people you could go to the church several times and maybe all you would get is one verse per day. And, and then maybe that verse would be pulled out of context because you don't know what the subject or the object was that the verse was taken from yourself. The pastor might. Hopefully he would bring that out by reading chapter by chapter and verse by verse so that it is God speaking and not man. If you study God's Word for yourself, then you're in good shape. It's okay. It's, it's good. Like, you're in church when you study with us. Um, we are assembled together through the Holy Spirit via the ether waves. That is to say, through television or radio, whichever the case may be. Uh, Carla from North Carolina. My mother taught me and my brothers and sisters that if you didn't take the mark of the beast that we would be <clears throat> headed by Satan. After listening to you, I don't believe this anymore, <clears throat> but I would like to know if this came from the rapture theory. Uh, God bless you and your staff. Now, it, it, you know, there was a time that Christians were beheaded. Not anymore. And why, because Satan can't pass him off, himself off as Messiah by beheading people. The book of Daniel tells that he comes in prosperously and peacefully. You can read of his coming in in the vile one 
in Daniel chapter 11, beginning with verse 21. You can read again of him in Daniel chapter 8. He comes in always prosperously and peacefully. And as it is written in Luke chapter 21, which is the profile of those events that transpire at the second advent, that is to say just before Christ returns, and he says there, they can't harm a hair on your head because you have the seal of God in your forehead, which simply means you have God's true word in your forehead and Christ has given us power over all of our enemies, including Satan. They don't want anything to do with us other than to try to convert us in a big church revival that they will have, okay? Not beheadings, but a big church revival. You don't have to premeditate what you'll say, but the Holy Spirit will speak through you as it is, as it is written in Mark 13. You read it, okay? Sydney from Oklahoma, will our pets go to heaven? Will, you know, will we know our people there? The answer is yes. And, uh, and uh, if, you, if, you work, um, if you have to work through church hours, that's okay. Better the deed, okay? Uh, and um, so uh, it is written in uh, Isaiah chapter 11 that animals will be in heaven, okay? I'm out of time. Hey, you know what? I love you all for a special reason. It's because you enjoy studying God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, but most of all, God loves you for it. You know something? You make His day. I said, you make God's day when you read His letter chapter by chapter and verse by verse with understanding. When you make His day, He's going to make yours. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God, He will always bless you. Most important, though, you listen to me, you stay in His Word. Every day in His Word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.